The ecosystem is a role-playing system I designed myself. This role-playing game doesn't have any form of game master whatsoever and we don't use any dices at all. We still have rules and systems to move the game forward. The philosophy of this game's rule system is that whatever you say will be bounced back at you and changed by the group. Just like you shout something out towards a mountain, it will echoing back at you with a different sound, therefore the name Ecosystem. This is not a role playing game where everyone has an individual character just for them. In fact, all the characters will be played by various people and it will be played by several different people. In fact, no one has a single individual character they own. Everyone owns all the characters together. This game is not focused at looting, hoarding, killing monsters and moving through dungeons. This is not a game where you build a character and select points and skills and try to grow that character and make that character stronger. This is a role-playing game focused at storytelling, building a story and character development. A different kind of character building. Also, in this game you don't need to sit down and create characters or discuss the world before the game begins. You can actually start playing immediately. In fact, the only preparation within your playgroup that you need to do to play this game is set a place, day and time of when you're gonna play. Then just show up and start playing immediately and just set the scene once everyone is sitting around the table. Now that we have introduced this game, what it is and what it isn't, let me show you the different containments inside this video of what we're gonna talk about. Here you can see different timestamps if you want to look at something specific, such as words of law, which is the rules of this game. They are the key part of this game and we use them to invoke effects and move the game forward. They are gonna be mentioned and talked about throughout all the other parts of this video, such as setting a scene, world building and character creation and conflict. The only part of this video we're not gonna talk about them is the last part, ending the game. Part 1. The words of law. In this game you say a specific sentence to kick in a certain rule effect. We call them words of law. They are the following. It shall not come to pass. The world belongs to you. Domain. I am. You are. And conflict. Let's look at them one by one shortly. They're gonna be talked about more in depth in later parts of the video. But before we begin I want to mention that there actually is more words and flaws than this because you can actually tweak the game and add or change the rules but that's for another video. It shall not come to pass is inspired by Gandalf putting his staff down and saying you shall not pass to the big demon. This is a veto word. And you could actually just say veto instead. You use this to prevent something from entering the game that you don't want to enter. This is not a game mechanic but more of a play and a preference and I don't like this mechanic. So for example if someone is creating something that you don't think makes sense or that you don't see how it actually works then you use this veto word of law. The world belongs to you is strictly a world building effect. You use this word of law when you want to give the power to someone to create something. One very important thing about this word of law is that it can only be used by someone who is setting a scene. Domain is the word of law to achieve order among the chaos. You use this word of law to give someone the responsibility, duty and privilege, you could also say, about a certain topic or area or something that has been created by the word of law, the world belongs to you. The person gains full dictatorship and all control and decides all matter about that subject. The subject or area or thing could be aliens, magic, demons, geography, a certain place, culture or anything that has been created 
by the word of law, the world belongs to you. The last thing you need to know about this before we proceed is that a player that has domain over a certain topic can't use that topic himself. For example, if a player has domain over magic, that player can't use magic whenever he or she is playing a wizard. This is to achieve game balance. I am is a word of law that is being used to create a positive effect on a character. Now, you just don't say I am, you actually say something that you are. So, for example, I am a wizard, I am a blacksmith, I am a bounty hunter, I am a starship trooper, I am a captain, I am a pilot, I am a police officer, etc, etc. But you could also say other things like I am rich, I am strong, I am beautiful. The world of law you are is the opposite, it's a negative thing. For the exact same amount of positive things, I am something positive, a character should have the exact same amount of you are something negative, so positive and negative balance out. This is also to create game balance. I am can only be used by a player when that player is playing that character, while you are can only be used when a character is being played by everyone else. It can't be the same player playing the character using a uh, you are on the same character. These word of laws can also never be used during conflict. Now, the word of law conflict is something you use when you want to avoid or prevent something uh, someone is doing. Let's say someone say he's going up and knocking you out. You don't want that to happen, so you say conflict. And now a series of things will happen. But we will go into depth of this later on in the video. Part 2. Setting a scene. Before we truly begin this part, I should mention that there's a lot of things you can actually say about this topic. And it actually deserves its own video. While here and now, we're just gonna go over the basics. Think of role-playing scenes the same way you're thinking of a movie. They are a bit jumpy, and you don't follow the same person all the time. For example, one scene, the main character, the protagonist, is investigating something. And in the second scene, you see the bad guys, the main character is investigating. And in the follow-up scene, the protagonist is driving his car towards the bad guys. And in the fourth scene, they have a conflict. This role-playing game is following the same example. You take turns in whatever form of turn order you choose to set scenes. This could be something that just moves around the table or some an other random variant you choose. There is no demand that everyone sets an equal amount of scenes. One person could set 70% of all the scenes while the rest is doing 10% each or so. There is also no demand that one person has to set a scene. You can simply set 0% scenes and just tag along on the game if you want to. The person who is setting the scene has four important responsibilities. Number one, starting the scene and making it connect to the entire story and all the other scenes. Number two, describe the scene. What is happening? What's going on? Number three, who is there? What characters are actually participating in the scene and the scene setter needs to give roles to all participating players. Number three, ending the scene. I recommend cliffhangers. Number one, the first one. We're gonna talk about that one a lot more in the last part of the video where we're talking about ending the game. So let's proceed to number two and number three, describing the scene and including people in it. The most important rule, in my opinion, to follow is to make open scenes. Don't tell people what they are doing and don't tell them what they should do. Just make it very open and let people figure out what they want to do. Let me give you an example. This could very much be the first scene that is being set in the entire game. Michael, the name of the player. You wake up in your sleeping quarters. You go towards the window as a daily routine. You look outside the window and then you're stunned by the sight because what you see is gonna change your life. 
The world belongs to you. What do you see outside the window that will change your life forever? If we break down what I currently said, I said something about your sleeping quarters, daily routine and window. So this could be placed pretty much anywhere. A sleeping bed, a daily routine and a window could exist in a spaceship, a submarine, a um, house somewhere up in the mountains, a house in the city, pretty much anywhere. So Michael, the player in the case, could pretty much go with whatever he wants that he sees outside the window. Making open scenes makes it possible for other players to do a little bit more open things. Now in this example, the word of law, the world belongs to you, was said. So here, Michael will create something. Something that he can see and something that will change his life. He has to create within that framework. So he could say something like a dragon. He sees a dragon that lands and attacks or something of that sort. And now you're currently playing in some form of a fantasy world. Or he say an alien invasion happens and you're playing in a different kind of world. Or he say I see a pirate ship or an enemy starship attacks. So this will kind of create a lot about the story, what kind of world you're playing in. Let's make a specific example. Michael is saying this. I see a person flying on a magical carpet. He seems wounded and he crash lands outside my house window. In this example, Michael has created another person and magic. So this new person should be played by another player. The person who is setting the scene should give this role to someone around the table that isn't participating in the scene currently. Also, the person who is setting the scene could now ask the new player that is playing the wounded person that was flying on the magical carpet, why were you wounded? Another thing that should happen currently is domain over magic. So Michael has just created magic. So someone should be responsible of dictating how magic works in this world. This should be done by Michael pointing at someone and saying you're in responsibility over magic. If no one wants it, Michael should have it. In the end it doesn't really matter who gets chosen just as someone is responsible for it. Another possible way is that no one gains domain over magic and just sit down and talk about it to great lengths. For example, you could all just agree that magic will work in this way and everyone will understand. A good way of doing this is just making it work the same way as another fictional story like Aladdin. If it later turns out that it just becomes chaotic, you could then give domain to someone and that person will now be responsible of dictating how magic will work. In the end, the method that I recommend is a three step system. A person is setting a scene. He is saying, the world belongs to you, Michael. Michael creates magic. Then Michael points at someone, let's say he points at Adam, and Adam gains domain over magic, even though Adam doesn't want it. With this method, a lot of players are participating in creating something together, and no one really has complete control over anything. Adam gained domain over magic, but he didn't know that he was gonna gain domain over magic. Michael decided he was gonna create magic, but he's not controlling magic at all. It's given to Adam, and he didn't know he was going to create something. The person who was setting the scene knew that something was gonna happen and he didn't know what was gonna happen. This will give you a system where everyone is participating creating something together, control and order about what is being created, something will make sure it sticks functional but also unpredictability. Let's proceed to the last step, number four cutting and ending the scene. Now I recommend cliffhangers. So for example in this scene Michael runs out and he looks at the wounded person and then the person who is setting the scene could simply say cut. They haven't talked to each other, they haven't given any names, we don't know who they are, we don't know much. We simply know that someone woke up, looked outside the window and saw someone falling from the sky and that's it. 
That's exciting! Everyone who's playing the game can now sit around the table and think about what's gonna happen next. And the next scene that's gonna be set by someone else could take place in the hut, in the cabin. The person who's flying the carpet is simply waking up. And maybe he doesn't even remember anything. Maybe he had a concussion. Another possible scene is a new place with new characters that are talking amongst themselves about hunting someone down, how the process is taking place and where they last saw him. This kind of scene would give us some idea of why the man on the flying carpet was wounded. Part 5. Conflict. Whenever someone says something you don't want to happen, you use the word of law conflict. And then you say what you do against this to prevent what is going to happen to you. So now we have two sides within this conflict with a different or the same goal. And it should be clarified what they want to achieve within this conflict if they win. There could be two versus one. There could be two players playing two different characters fighting against another singular character. The conflict doesn't need to be a fighting one either. It could be a debate, a discussion or a haggle over a prize of some sort. It could also be a conflict versus a natural disaster or maybe a trap. Let's say the person who is setting the scene has created an earthquake and then suddenly something is happening. There's a rift in the ground and you're falling down. Conflict I'm trying to avoid falling down. Whenever you have a conflict, you have a bunch of people participating in it and you have a bunch of people who are not participating in it. The people who are not participating are audience. They're gonna take part in this conflict, but they're gonna be voting, judging, observatories. The system of how conflict is being resolved is a storytelling system and a debating system. The storytelling and acting doesn't stop once there is a conflict you need to resolve. The storytelling and acting continues within the conflict. The participating combatants that are trying to win the conflict are simply saying arguments why they should win and throwing the ball over to the other side to now respond to their new argument. For example, if this is a wrestling game one combatant could say, I am stronger and point at his character sheet where it says strong. And this is where the character creation strong comes into consideration. So for example, this character is now stronger and should win the fight, the brawl, the wrestling because he is stronger. That is actually a good argument. And this is also why we can't use the words of law I am and you are during a conflict. Whenever a participating combatant have said an argument and have thrown the ball over to the other side, it's the audience turn to decide the actual outcome. The person on the other side who is receiving the ball that is now gonna soon respond to this argument have to wait a while before the audience have their take on it. The audience responsibility in this and privilege is to decide if an argument is actually successful, if being strong in a wrestling game should have an effect. Now the characteristics being strong should definitely have a positive effect inside a wrestling match, so that should definitely be approved. But for example, if someone say, I'm really small and tiny and slippery, so I will avoid you, that could actually be denied by the audience. If an argument is denied by the audience, it's a strict up fail and the other side immediately wins the conflict and their goal is, just, is achieved. If the argument is approved, however, the storytelling shall begin. Anyone from the audience who decides that this is actually approved could just start immediately speaking and telling a story of what is happening to the advantage of the person that you have just recently spoken. Think of it as a tennis or ping pong match where you're throwing a ball over to the other side. Whenever you successfully throw a ball over to the other side with a winning argument that is approved by the audience, the audience should tell a story where you are winning the combat and inflicting damage. 
But anywhere during the story mode of the audience, the other side that is currently losing could abrupt them and say, I have a response. I want to do this in response to that, then it's gonna win me over and throw the ball back, so I'm now the winner. That's all you actually need to know, but there are three things I would like to mention before we leave this part. The first thing, let the audience take its time to think about what the person said and also let the audience speak for a while and let the story flow. So the other combatant, the one side that is losing, should give the audience some time to tell the story before he responds. Otherwise it just becomes a shouting game. A few seconds is appropriate. The second thing is that you can be quite tactical with this system. If you know that your opponent is weak in a certain situation, a scenario or place, you can try to take the fight to that place and use the environment as arguments for your combat debate. So far what we currently have with this conflict system is a game where all players are participating even though they are not directly involved in the conflict. We also have a conflict that doesn't disrupt or hurt the story. The conflict is part of the story. Third, the last thing I want to mention is, there is actually a lot more to know about this, but this is just the basics. There are a lot of different tweaks and changes you can do to the system to change the system depending on how you want the game to function and be like. But that's for another video. The final part, ending the game. This is something that can also be talked about quite a lot, but we're gonna make it quite short and simple. Nothing here is really set in stone, and it all comes down to what your playgroup actually seeks. Are you looking for a never-ending story, an adventure that just keeps on going for new places? Think of Star Trek, or maybe a pirate ship, or another ship crew, or simply just adventurers walking the earth. In Star Trek we follow the bridge, the captain, the first mate, the pilot, the engineer, doctor, etc, etc. And they come to new places, new worlds, new scenes, ongoing forever. This sort of story would have the same main characters in every single session you play, but new side characters depending on what planet and world they're visiting. That's one way of doing it, just never ending the story. I don't think we need to focus more on that. Let's talk about one-shots instead. One-shots are simply a one-session game. You meet up on a certain day, you play, and then it's done. You will never take part in those characters and that world again. You will simply leave it. One-shots are fast, explosive, and you can do a lot of new things. You can test new areas, and then you abandon them and play another one-shot, where you test new things. To make one-shots work, you need a planned, or I could also say, programmed ending. Otherwise, they will just keep on going forever. And that's not what you're looking for your one-shot. You're looking for an epic ending. Something that you will leave behind and remember. If you don't get that epic ending, it will just sit there and hang in the air. And you're wondering actually what happened to the characters you left behind. And that can be quite irritating. It's a lot more fun to remember a story well written from start to finish. If you read a story but you haven't read the finish, that's a bit irritating. There is a lot of different systems and techniques you can apply to reach an ending with your playgroup. But here and now we're just gonna look at one of them and we're going to introduce a new word of law. Answer me this and then you say something that you need an answer to. That someone in the playgroup should answer during the game to end the game. Every participating player should make one of these words of law answer me this. And when all of these questions have been answered, the game ends. Simple as that. Here are some examples of answer me this questions you could make. What's beneath the large mountain? 
Why was the man on the carpet wounded? What does the magical ring that you stole do? Where did the stranger come from? And why is he here? What are the old men around the red table scheming? Etc. Etc. Like this. Remember, every participating player in the game should make one of these words of law answer me this questions. They are gonna be answered either by players setting a scene when this is answered. For example, what's beneath the mountain, someone can set a scene that takes place beneath the mountain inside a dungeon. And now that's kinda answered, depending on what you think about it. Or the question could be answered by someone during a scene doing something that will answer the question depending on the question. Therefore, don't make questions answer me this that is a little bit impossible to answer. When all questions are answered, you will take turn and describe the outcome, the final outcome. And this is done by the players for each time they have answered a question. So for example, what's beneath the mountain? If Mike answers this question, because Mike was setting a scene showcasing what was beneath the mountain or something of that sort, then Michael gets to describe the future outcome of that dungeon that he showcased during the scene. Michael now have full dictatorship and all the power in the world to describe whatever he wants about what's beneath the mountain in the dungeon. So for example, he can say that it collapsed and all the treasures are gone for good. If someone is playing the stranger and tells people why he is in town and tells a story of where he come from, that person will now be the one who is answering that question. Let's say this is done by Adam. Now Adam in the end of the game will now have full dictatorship, full power to describe what is happening to the stranger. He could say something like, the stranger settles down and gets married and starts a family. Or he could simply say, uh, the stranger wanders off and dies. And of course, someone should answer the question about what the old men around the red table were scheming. Let's say this is done by Michael. Now hold on, Michael have already answered another question. What was beneath the mountain? And now he's answering another one. Yes, one player can answer several different questions. And then that person will have more power over to describe what is happening at the end of the story. What is the final outcome of the story? You should of course follow a little bit of what have actually happened during the game. For example, if the heroic stranger intervened and stopped the old man's plot, then that should definitely be taken into account by Michael. That is basically it. Every player makes a question. You, everyone is trying to answer these questions. And when all the questions have been answered, you have a final outcome by the players who answer those questions one by one. And then you have a complete and finalized story. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope it brought you something. This is the basics of the Echo System role-playing game. Made by Mod.